Hi everyone! Today, we'll be learning more about law and order in Singapore under British colonial rule, part 1. Now, we know that the British aims to develop Singapore into a thriving port city and maximise profit, but the idea is how. Previously, we learned about how British ensured that the port facilities were developed to accommodate growing numbers of traders entering the country. But, in order to ensure that traders would continuously come into Singapore, British has to ensure that Singapore was a safe and peaceful place to be in. Hence the focus of today's lesson. So by the end of today's online lesson, you will be able to identify and elaborate on the law and order problems faced by the British in Singapore. These are the challenges that we'll be looking at for the second part of Chapter 3. The first challenge is labour abuses. By the late 1800s, Singapore had grown into a flourishing commercial centre in the region. This attracted more and more Chinese migrants to Singapore. Singapore was known as Coolie Town by the end of 19th century, and upon their arrival in Singapore, they were sent to work as coolies in Singapore or to other, or to other parts of the world. However, how would the coolie go about obtaining a job located far away from their homeland? These Chinese migrants often come to work in Singapore under the impression that working overseas is a solution to their poverty. There are generally two groups of migrants. Some had the money to pay for their passage from China. When they arrived in Singapore, they were free to take on any job they found. Basically, this passage money in today's context was similar to the paperwork and other administration fees foreigners would have to settle before they came to work in Singapore. However, there were others who were too poor to pay for their passage money and had to find a coolie agent who would pay for it. In return, these coolies promised to work for any employer who was willing to pay the coolie agent a sum of money to employ them. This sum was often more expensive than the passage money as it included the coolie agent's fee. So if you think about it, the coolies had to pay both the employer and the coolie agent, which is a lot. The coolies would then have to work without pay for a year or more to pay off the huge amount of debt that they now owe. If you realise by now, this would mean that their dream of earning more and living a better life is getting more and more out of reach. So how did the coolies come to Singapore? While many willingly became coolies because they were hoping to seek their fortune abroad, many others were kidnapped or tricked by coolie agents. So for example, they were not told that they would eventually become coolies. They will most probably be promised office jobs or high-paying jobs. Jobs that sounded very reputable or highly respected to them. When they were making their way to Singapore, they will have no choice but to board overcrowded ships, which lack food and water or basic nutrition or hygiene. Known as floating hells, these ships saw the death of many coolies before they even reached Singapore. But when they did arrive in Singapore, Coolies were locked up in overcrowded and unhygienic conditions so that they could not escape until they were hired as labourers. They were closely guided by gangsters hired by coolie agents until employers were found. With these bad treatments, as well as the burden of their debt weighing them down, many tried to escape their misery by gambling and turning to opium. This often leads to them getting an opium addiction and eventually dying from them. Here is some additional information from you for you. Apart from Chinese coolies, there were Indian coolies as well in 19th century Singapore. The second challenge that were found in Singapore is the secret society problems. Imagine that you're Wei Xin, a 20-year-old Chinese migrant from Shantong, China. You come from a poor family and could not go to school, so you decided to work in Singapore. You've never left your hometown, your hometown before, so once you reach Singapore, you feel lonely and helpless. In Singapore, many, many Chinese migrants have joined secret societies. By 1840s, there were several secret societies with thousands of members. If you are Wei-Sin, would you join a secret society? How do you think would you benefit? Now, many of those who arrived from China found it useful to join a secret society. They enjoyed the protection. There were people to actually keep a lookout for them. However, in order for you to reap the benefits of being in this group, this would mean that they'll have to take part in robberies, fights, 
and other forms of lawlessness. This usually takes place at night, but sometimes even in broad daylight. This made Singapore unsafe. Until the 1870s, the government was unable to manage the problem as there were no British officials who understood the various Chinese dialects. Local policemen were either Indian or Malay. It was thus difficult to find out anything about the secret societies and their activities. So, we have covered two problems so far, labour abuses and secret society problems. In the next lesson, we'll take a look at the other problems that Singapore was facing then and finally, what the British eventually did to settle them.